proven wrong that I can see all of you from here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tanya. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks, uh, based here in Singapore. The Singaporeans among you may be able to tell from my accent that I'm not really from here, but Singapore is my second home. Um, a bit of a plug, um, I co-organize Rails Girls in Singapore, and we have an event coming up tomorrow morning at 9.30, um, and we have a coach briefing at 9, so I'm hoping to see some of you there tomorrow. So today I'm going to talk about uh, collaborating with contracts, and let's start with real-life collaboration. When two parties collaborate in real life, what do they do? Um, I think there are two possibilities. One, they can just do it. Um, and this can happen if the two parties trust, trust each other already. Uh, but this depends on goodwill because uh, the obligations of both parties are not explicitly stated anywhere. Or they can negotiate a contract and adhere to the contract. This can be tedious at the beginning, but once the contract is there, uh, the, both parties can refer to it, and um, when one of them don't fulfill any obligation, uh, the other party knows exactly uh, what that is. So this is an example of a contract in real life. Uh, we have, uh, let's say, a supermarket who wants to get some, some uh, ice cream from some supplier. So the contract will specify obligations of both sides. In this case, for the consumer, that the consumer has to order a week in advance and that it has to pay at the time of order. And on the provider side, it, has, um, it specifies that the provider has to deliver within three business days and that the product must not expire within two months. That's all I have about real life. Now moving along to not real life. Uh, when I mentioned collaboration, I meant it in the context of services. Can I get a show of hands? Who has had to deal with services, whether consuming it or providing it? Right, quite a few. Um, so just to refresh our minds a little bit, what is a service? A service is a reusable software component encapsulating a business function. And it can be exposed over HTTP, queue, or any other transfer protocol. For every service, there can be, uh, there's a single provider and one or many consumers. And as a developer, you may be responsible for all of this or some or just one piece. Then there's a term uh, service contracts or contracts when it comes to services. At the most basic level, uh, this can contain just an expectation about request and response. So, uh, and they are usually written from the point of view of the provider. So the request will be the request that the provider understands, and the response is the response that the provider sends back to all consumers, regardless of what they actually need. Service contracts can also uh, have other things, for example, performance characteristics. For example, that the, uh, the, the provider has to return a response within 100 milliseconds under a certain kind of load. But for today, we will focus on request and response. Just to visualize this a bit better, um, in this person service example, the response part of the contract will specify these three fields, ID, name, and age, regardless of what the consumers actually need. Um, at my workplace, ThoughtWorks, I've been involved in a Ruby project for over a year now, and one of the things I learned um, is contract test. I fiddle around quite a bit with it, and I hope to share some cases where it might be useful. Um, so with that, let's go to the first one. Uh, coming back to the person service example, let's say that the provider again returns three fields, ID, name, and age. And there are two consumers. Consumer A only cares actually about two fields, ID and age. The fact that the provider returns another field name, um, it doesn't really care about that. And then there's another consumer, consumer B, that expects also two fields, but a different one, ID and name. And then let's assume that there is another consumer coming in which expects first name and last name. Well, obviously now to please consumer C, uh, the provider has to, re has to send over first name and last name. Let's suppose that the team in charge of, provider, uh, of the provider just updates, just removes the field name and replaces it with first name and last name. What will happen? Uh, consumers A and B will break because um, these, 
actually can somewhere be a break because it is the only one that expects uh, first name and last name. So that's not great. Um, of course, the provider team can could have they could have kept name and just introduced the two new fields on top of the existing ones. But suppose they really do have to remove name. Will they at least know that the consumers A and B will break before the, consumer, uh, the consumers themselves complain? Uh, they will not if the provider doesn't even know what the consumers A and B expect from it. But it will if the expectations are explicit and known to them. So that is what consumer-driven contracts aim to help with. Consumer-driven contracts make consumer expectations explicit. Unlike service contracts, which are written from the provider's side uh, um, or with the provider in mind, consumer different contracts are written uh, from the point of view of the consumer. So we will have one consumer different contract per consumer. Um, in this case, contract A will specify that consumer A needs ID and age to be returned from the provider. Con contract B will specify that consumer B needs ID and name and so on. So taken individually, uh, the consumer different contract is not exhaustive. But if we sum all of them up, um, then the provider, the provider can find out uh, what it needs to return to satisfy all of the consumers. So in this case, if we sum up contract A, B, and C, we will find out that the provider has to return ID, age, name, first name, and last name. Why is this useful? Like any tool, services are only useful when they are actually used. And so the consumer has to know how to deal with the response that the provider returns. Otherwise, it's not really going to be used. And the second point is that consumer driven contracts make uh, consumer expectations explicit. So when something breaks, um, you can find out which particular consumer is affected, how, and how to fix it. Going one step further, there is also a consumer-driven contract test. It's quite a mouthful. But uh, basically, they have, like any other test, they have the goodness of consumer-driven contracts and more. They are executable, um, so we don't have to refer to some long document, just, just, to, uh, just execute something. And they can be run as part of the build pipeline, so we can get quick and frequent feedback. Also. We know how Word documents become stale, uh, but this is a test. And so as long as we run them regularly, we are kind of forced to update it. And so it becomes um, a living documentation of source of the system. Here is an example of when it is useful. Um, let's assume that there is an expensive call or computation that the provider needs to do to provide the field friends. But none of the consumer-driven contract tests break when we remove that field. So that means that tells us that it is safe to remove. If not because of the consumer different contract test, it will be harder to detect this. So we have to, let's say, go through some 20 page document to find out that it's not used and then remove it. Uh, the other thing about consumer different contract test is that it plays well with TDD. And here's a workflow. Uh, consumer C is the one that's new, so we write consumer driven contract tests for consumer C. Um, and at first, it will fail. It will fail because consumer C at first will not even make the right request to the provider. So that, that's exactly what we need to do to make it pass. This is the normal red-green refactor cycle that we have with TDD. So after that, we can refactor. And that's, the, that's what we have to do in the, on the consumer side. And then we move over to the provider side, and we have the same cycle, red-green refactor. It will be read at first because the provider, when given the response that's specified in the contract, will not return what is expected. And so to make it green, we have to make the provider return what that particular consumer expects. And then we refactor. The last part uh, that's really important is that we have to make sure that the other consumer driven contract test for the other consumers still passes as well because we want to make sure that all the existing consumers still work. So that is the first use case. And to tie this back up, this is all about making consumer expectations explicit to the provider. So moving forward to the second one, whenever we have service provider and consumer communicating with each other, 
To make unit tests more deterministic, we often introduce, uh, we often test around the service boundary. So on the consumer side, we often have a provider stub, uh, for example, using something like WebMock. So then on the unit test for the consumer side, it will use the provider stub, and it will verify that the consumer processes the stub response properly. Moving on to, to the provider side, the provider side will typically have some kind of request from some fake consumer, and then uh, the test will verify that the provider returns the right response given that request. Usually at the beginning, everything will be good, but after a while, there could be a mismatch. For example, uh, here the consumer expects address, and the provider stop returns that, uh, but the provider site itself is not updated. And so the unit test, and also the unit test for the provider doesn't even know that this is happening. So everything seems okay from the provider's point of view. The unit test for both sites will continue to pass, but the application may actually blow up because of this mismatch. So how can contract tests help? It can help by verifying both sites against the same contract, thereby making sure that there's no mismatch. So one way this could look is we, uh, write, the, we write expectations from the consumer side. Again, this is putting some emphasis on the consumer side. And from there, we generate the contract. And then we verify that the provider adheres to the same contract. To tie this back up, this case was all about making sure that the provider and the consumer do their job and not just think they do their job. Making sure that they can really communicate with each other. So moving on to case three, um, in my team, we have had to keep two systems in sync via services. Um, and one end is handled by our team and another is handled by a separate team. For some business functions, we are in charge of the providers and for some others, we are in charge of the consumers. We were starting from scratch, so at the beginning, there was nothing. None of the services have been built and there was no schema, no interface. Um, so we, we started with that. We started with deciding on the service contract, specifically the interface and the schema for the request and the response. But we didn't want that to just be a document that will go stale. So we wanted an executable contract or effectively contract test. With an executable contract or contract test, the consumer team can go off on their own and when they are ready, they can just execute the contract test and make sure they adhere to it. And the same goes for the provider side. The provider team can go off on their own and when they are ready, they can execute the contract test and if it passes, that means they are done. So with that, both teams can develop their site independently. They don't, they don't have to wait for each other. And this is particularly useful because we had a lot of services and so we don't have to think, hey, let's do this one first and then let's do this, this other one. Um, so if those tests pass on both the consumer and the provider side, we know that both sides will be able to communicate. But of course, after that, we still have to do um, integration testing. So this case was all about enabling parallel development. With that, I'll go on to introduce you to a gem that we have been using to write our contract test. It's called PACT, and it is designed to write consumer-driven contract test. The PACT workflow goes like this, uh, and I'll have to close over some of the details. Uh, first, we write tests for the consumer side. And we specify the, uh, the service that we are testing that will, be, that will have to be configured beforehand. Um, and then in the given when then style, we specify a given a person with too many friends, for example, upon receiving requests for person details. So this is just some description. And then we specify the request specification. Um, so this is what we expect the request to be like. Um, the details will be things like HTTP method, the path, the query params, form params, and header. This will later be used to verify that the consumer makes the right call, and also this is the call that the provider must understand. And then we move on to specifying the, uh, the response. Similarly, there are uh, things like HTTP status and headers, and then there's the body. Um, the other thing is that PACT runs a mock server when you run a test, 
And the mock server will return this exact response when given the request that matches the request that we specified just before. And then on the next step, we call the method on, our, on the app, on the consumer side, that makes the actual HTTP request. And we verify that it, it, it processes the response from the provider or from the mock provider properly. So we run it. Um, and we will see it fail at first, again, because the consumer doesn't even uh, make the right HTTP call right now, probably not, not any HTTP call at all. So um, at this stage, to make it pass, we just need to make that HTTP call and process it. And we don't need to care whether the provider is doing the right thing or whether it has even been implemented, because that will be tested separately. When we run the consumer site test, uh, it will generate a PACT or a JSON representation of the contract containing all the service, uh, all the uh, request and response specifications. The PACT file will then need to be shared over to the provider. Uh, this can be done either on your own or using the tools that PACT has. Uh, PACT actually has a suite of tools. One of them is called PACT Broker, which also handles things like versioning. So then uh, we go to the provider side and we have to verify that the provider follows the pact or, or the contract. And we do that just by uh, doing a rate pact verify. This fires actual HTTP request to the provider and so it exercises the full stack of the provider from the controller, the serializer, the service, the model, the whole thing. So it is exactly the same way that your actual consumer will, will exercise that. So a bit more on PACT, um, it also comes with an out of process or standalone stub. So we saw earlier that you can, you can run your unit test against the stub, but uh, with this out of process stub, you can also run your actual consumer, let's say a single page application against this provider stub. And you know that whatever response you get from here will be the exact one that your actual provider will return. PACT also has something called provider states. So we saw this earlier, given a person with too many friends. This is actually a provider state, and what it gives us is the ability to set up and tear down data for that particular provider state. So um, this data setup will be run on the provider side just before the request is processed by the provider. So in this case, I'm just inserting 10,000 friends to the person. By default, PACT tries to match the actual response from the provider with the one that is specified in the PACT exactly. So type and value both. But there, it is also possible to just verify on type using something like this, using actually PACT something like. Um, and also, it is possible to specify a regex pattern and, and match based on that pattern. To sum up, we, we went through some use cases, um, first being making consumer expectations explicit, making sure both the consumer and the provider do their job, and enabling parallel development. And we also covered PACT. With this, of course, the devil is in the details, uh, for example, and how to integrate it with your existing test, and also um, how much to assert on the response, um, because each code path on your consumer side may have different expectation. And your, your mileage may vary as well, because let's say if there's only one consumer uh, for your service, then making consumer expectations explicit is probably not going to help that much. It also depends on how much influence you have on the provider, the team in charge of the provider and consumer, because you need to assert some kind of influence for them to actually do this, because this has to be done on both sides. So these are not silver bullets, but I hope I've provoked some thoughts in your head to start considering and start thinking about contract tests when you see collaboration using services. Um, and like other tests, uh, add them in your build pipeline for the quick and frequent feedback. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much, Tanya. Do you guys have any questions for her? Okay. Hi there. Uh, my name is Zach. 
So um, at the company I, I kind of work for, we're using kind of Rails um, almost to build a big monolith to pretty quickly explore the kind of problem space that we're in. And very quickly, once we understand it, we're kind of thinking about carbon-away services um, and maybe using more exotic languages where we can kind of squeeze more out of the boxes. So one of the problems we have is as soon as we start doing that, we'll need to sort of define these contracts. But we'll need to do it in kind of a more language agnostic way that's not necessarily bonded to Ruby or Rails or anything like that. Um, are there any sort of more general solutions that aren't so, like Pact is pretty glued to Ruby, but uh, I mean, ideally we'd want something we can kind of define a JSON specification that would work on, you know, whatever situation we'd want. So, I'm kind of curious about that. Okay, uh, so Pact actually, as I mentioned, it has a suite of tools, not just this gem and not just Pact Broker. It also has um, an equivalent to Rake Pact Verify, but for providers that are not written in Ruby. So, there are tools um, around Pact that are specifically for this. But having said that, there is another tool which I haven't used. It's called Pacto. It's very similar. It's just with an O at the end. Um, and that one also um, supports non-Ruby uh, non service consumers and providers. So those two things um, are the ones that you can check out. Thanks a lot. All right, if you do, you can find Tanya during the break. Um, let's thank her again for coming out. Thank you.